Um, just a refresher, I know we just talked last night, but a lot happened since last night between sharks swimming around in rooms and great fish, right? Things like that. Um, so I'm just as tired as the rest of you guys, I understand, but self-induced. Um, but right last night we were talking about how, you know, Jonah directly disobeyed God and he was trying to do everything in his power to oppose God, but God still advances his plans. He accomplishes what he wills, what he wants. And we see how Jonah was honestly worse than the pagans, worse than the sailors on the boat. And he was not fearing God. He was not trusting God. He was not following God's commandments. He was picking and choosing. And so that's where we pick up in the story, right? The last verse that we read, we read that God appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And that's where we find ourselves now. Jonah is in the belly of this great fish. And as we start this morning, uh, I'd like for you to envision, right, we see snow outside and we're supposed to get another three inches of snow up here this afternoon, so that'll be fun, right? Um, we have an activity planned and it's outdoors, so hopefully you guys are okay being cold, brought some good jackets and stuff. You have nice hoodies. Um, but I'd like you to envision that you see these two cars driving down the road, and let's say the roads are icy, there's tons of snow, and the first car, you see those nice white plates with red cursive letters. It's a California plate. So someone from California is here driving in the snow. And you see them start to fishtail. They're starting to go crazy and they wipe out. And all of a sudden, they're in a snowbank. And the car is like stuck. They're trying to back out, pull forward, do anything. And they are stucker than stuck. Okay, so th there's that first car. But then you see this big old truck coming along and it's got these massive tires and it's got the red, white, and blue Idaho plates on it. This guy's got this big beard, he's wearing a flannel. He's like, yeah, I'm Idaho. And he's drifting around, he's like trying to do donuts on the road. He's driving reckless, but it looks purposeful and he's just having a good time. All of a sudden he wipes out and he's in the snowbank too. But it's, an, it's a bigger snowbank and he's not going anywhere either. His car is stuck his truck, whatever it is, and he is going nowhere. Well, out of the kindness of your heart, you go down there with this big old tow strap and an ATV or something where you can pull them out. And both the Californian and the Idahoan, they're like, hey, I'm stuck. I really want to get out of here. I, I really regret that I'm stuck. I wish I was not here. I'd like to get going. Why am I stuck? And so you help them both get unstuck. But the Californian, how did he get stuck? Well, he didn't know how to drive in the snow. He's just barely holding on for dear life, and the car happened like that. He didn't know. So when you get him unstuck, he's like, hey, will you help me learn how to drive in the snow so I don't get stuck again because my Toyota Prius is not going to last in the <laughs> snow, right? But then the Idahoan gets out, and he's like, man, thanks for getting me out of here. And right away, he goes on. And he keeps doing the donuts and drifting. And you're like, dude, you're going to get stuck again. Did you learn nothing the first time? And he was really bummed when he was stuck. He's like, man, I really need help. I shouldn't have done that. That was so dumb. And as soon as you pull him out, he's back to doing the same old thing. It's kind of dumb. But he's like, I got a truck. I'll be fine. Right? Well, where we left off in our passage, Jonah, he's stuck in the belly of the whale. And up to this point, he has not called out to God. But we finally see that he's about to call out to God. And we're going to see, okay, is he crying out to God because he's stuck in a, a bad circumstance? Or is he really sorrowful about what he did, right? There's these two terms that you may hear, worldly sorrow versus godly sorrow. And we're going to look at that today. But we're going to see, okay, like the Californian, was he really sorry? Did he really regret that he was driving the way he did? Because as soon as you pull him out, he's going right back to his old ways and he's probably going to get stuck again. Where the Californian, yeah, they also regret it. Maybe they were driving recklessly, but they're saying, hey, teach me, help me to change so I can drive safer and not get stuck next time. And Jonah, he prays in the Jonah chapter two. It's all a prayer that Jonah writes and sings or prays to the Lord. And so we're going to see is Jonah praying to the Lord because he's stuck in a bad circumstance and once the circumstance is better, he's just going to go back to his old ways. Is he truly repenting? And what does this have to do with us, right? Maybe you have a circumstance where you've sinned and your parents catch you. 
and you're like bummer and you feel just your gut sinks you're like oh man but then as you're like you apologize and you're working through it you know maybe you're sad that you got caught or maybe you're sad that you have consequences or maybe you're sad that you disappointed your parents but then you know the consequences wear off maybe you got grounded or maybe i don't know what your parents do for punishment but you work through the punishment and you're a couple weeks removed and you're like the same idea of what I did before, count sinic words, kind of sounds nice. And maybe you think about going back into that sin that you committed just a couple weeks ago and you said, I'm sorry, you went through the consequences and you're like, now you're toying around with sinning again. And it's like, why? Right? Versus like, maybe your parents catch you in your sin and you're like, you're right. God says that's wrong. I'm sorry. And I want to change. Help me to change. And maybe it doesn't mean the temptation goes away right away but you approach it differently. And instead of thinking, how can I get away with this this time so I don't get in trouble? You're thinking, how can I say no to this? How can I get help to fight it, right? So those are two different examples of worldly and godly sorrow. And we're going to look more at that, but we're going to look at Jonah's prayer and see what does true repentance look like? What do we pray to the Lord when we've sinned? And maybe we have negative circumstances as a result of our sin, but we should want to, to change, we should want God's help, not to get out of the circumstances, but so that we can grow and put off our sin and put on obedience. So with that, uh, go ahead and look at your Bibles. We're going to start in Jonah 2, verse 1. And just look at what elements of Jonah's prayer are there. What is he saying to God? What is he asking for God to do to him? And think about it. This is the first time that we have recorded Jonah saying anything to God, right? God sent, said to Jonah, hey, go talk to Nineveh. And it doesn't even say Jonah said anything back. It just says Jonah went the opposite direction. So these are really the first words we have recorded of Jonah speaking to the Lord. And so this is what he says. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever." Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you, into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord." And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Right, so maybe Jonah did pray to the Lord earlier, and maybe Jonah talked with God before, but we don't have that recorded in here. And I think that was purposeful of highlighting in where is Jonah at, right? And what was God doing to bring Jonah to this place? Well, if you think about it, Jonah, he's run away from God. He's gone through this storm. He sunk in the water, right? So it's saying like he went down when he's talking about like to the belly of Sheol, to the depths of the sea, the mountains, roots. Like this is all poetic language. He is at the bottom of the ocean, bottom of the sea. There's nowhere, like he is sunk to the very bottom. He's probably starting to lose oxygen, starting to lose consciousness. And he's hopeless. He probably thinks, okay, this is my time. I'm going to die. This is what I wanted. This is what I committed to. I don't know what his thoughts were, but this is where he's at. And then he gets swallowed by the fish, right? God appointed the fish to save Jonah because if God hadn't done that, Jonah would have died, right? God in his graciousness, God in his kindness, and God in his sovereignty, right? He wanted for this to happen. He appointed for the fish to swallow Jonah. Did Jonah deserve this? Let's think about that. Did he deserve it? No, absolutely not. He was, he was committed to his way. He was committed to disobedience. He's like, nope, I'm sticking with it. Jonah deserved to die, right? 
Just like Jonah thought the Ninevites deserved to die, Jonah deserved to die. But God said, yeah, you may deserve that, but I'm going to send the fish to preserve your life. Because Jonah would have died. He would not have been able to swim up and get back to shore. He was, he was hopeless. But God brought this fish as a way of salvation for Jonah. And so then Jonah, in this fish, he's finally reached the point where he's like, I'm going to call out to God. Jonah would have died without calling out to God had God not initiated saving him. Right? So put this down for point number one. Praise God for reaching out to save you in his loving mercy and grace. Praise God for reaching out to save you in his loving mercy and grace. And I'll try to not stand in the way of everyone. Um, right, so if you look at Jonah 1.15, what, we looked at that last night. It says, so they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Jonah 1.17, that's the next thing we see. The Lord appointed the great fish to swallow up Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord. Right, so while Jonah is actively in his sin, while Jonah was sinking in the storm, that's when God chose to show loving mercy and grace to him. This teaches us something amazing about the character of God, right? God doesn't love us only once we've done everything to please him. God doesn't wait for us to live in perfect obedience. He shows love to us while we are still sinful and actively running from him. Here, I'll slide this way a little bit so not as much in the way. Are you able to see Simon? Ish, okay. So write this down as a cross-reference, Ephesians 2, 1 through 5. Ephesians 2, 1 through 5. We see God's love displayed not only towards Jonah, but towards us. It says this, And when you were dead, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You were dead, right? Like Jonah, he was as good as dead at the bottom of the sea. There was no hope for him. Up until that point, there's no record of people being swallowed by fish and staying alive. Like if we heard of someone being swallowed by a fish today, like breaking news, guy was in a fish for three days. Like, oh yeah, that happened once in the Bible. Like, I'm kind of surprised. That's crazy, but it's happened before. No, it's like this has never happened before. So Jonah wasn't expecting, maybe if God wants to save me, he'll bring a fish. No, he's like, I'm dead. And that's when God shows love. And in Ephesians 2, 1 through 5, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all, we all are in this position, once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Every single one of us, really, can, if we're before Christ or before our salvation, are in the same spot as Jonah. We are dead in our sins without hope. But then we get to verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Guys, this is amazing that God would reach down to save you when you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Not only do you have a problem, but you're dead. You don't know. You can't call out for help. You can't fix your problem. You're dead. You are hopeless. There is no hope if God does not reach down to save you. For Jonah, there was no hope. There was no chance for him unless God reached down to save him. And for that, we should praise God, right? Praise him for reaching out to save us in his loving and mercy and grace. Praise him for these attributes. We could never praise him enough for these things. Singing Jesus, thank you. Singing worthy, worthy. We could sing those songs for all of eternity and it wouldn't be enough to say thank you for what he has done for us. Right? 1 John 4.19 says this, We love because he first loved us. Or Romans 5, 6 through 8, write down this reference as well. Romans 5, 6 through 8. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us 
in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Do you think Jonah would have died for the Ninevites? Absolutely not. Yet Christ died for us and we're just as wicked, right? We can look at this in an example such as adoption, right? There, if there's a child, they can't force parents to adopt them into their family unless someone comes and says, hey, I want you to be part of my family. Come home with me. They're still stuck at the orphanage. They don't have a family. But a family comes and says, hey, we want you to be part of our family. Get in the car. You're coming with us. And they, they get them new clothes and provide food and home and love and shelter. And they didn't deserve any, any of that in the sense that like they didn't win the parents' favor. They weren't like, hey, you guys look like pretty good parents. I like your parenting style. Or they didn't say, hey, I really like the way you decorate your home. Like They didn't try to convince the parents. The parents said, hey, we want to love you. We choose you. Come be part of our home. And that's what God did with us. We didn't do anything to gain his favor. No amount of good works that you do could make you more appealing to God. You may think you're pretty good, like you got some good gifts, I don't know, whatever. Nothing about you is going to make you more appealing or desirable to be part of God's family. No, God chooses you because He's loving and He's gracious. If anything, it should turn our attention and say, wow, God, you are so kind. You are so amazing, right? If you look at, like, if we were playing dodgeball, it would make sense for all of us to want to pick Lumpy to be on our team, right? Because he... If you guys don't know, his nickname has been Lumpy for a while. I just learned that recently. Paul. Um, anyways, if everyone would want Paul to be on our dodgeball team, right? He's slinging them. He's tall. He can catch. It makes sense. But they may not want to have me, right? I'm not good at catching dodgeballs. I have glasses, so if they get knocked off, maybe I won't see as well. It, Paul is the much more obvious choice for dodgeball, right? But... That's not how it works with God. There are not more obvious choices for someone to be part of God's family or less obvious choices. None of us are deserving and none of us are a more obvious choice. God is simply kind and loving and gracious that he would pick any of us. And for that, we should praise him. So what should we do with this information? How should we apply this? What should be different in our lives? Well, I think for starters, this should leave all of us humbled. I think we should all see, wow, I'm really not that great of a person. Like Jonah, he was arrogant. Like I am the prophet of the Lord. There were very few prophets as far as like the whole population. There were not a ton of prophets. So he's like, I'm a prophet of God and I'm an Israelite chosen by God. Like I'm a pretty good guy. He's like, no, be humbled. You were going to die. God chose to save you out of his grace, right? And just like us, like, well, I grew up in a Christian family I'm a really good kid. I never get in trouble. I've got good grades. Everything's going right for me. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty good. Like, no, be humble. The fact that you have anything, the fact that you're still breathing, that's because God chooses to let you breathe. And God has chosen to be patient enough to not punish you immediately for your sin. I think this should also leave us thankful, right? There is, We should not grumble or we should not be angry at God, even if everything was taken away from us, if we had no money, if we had no friends, if we had what felt like no one loved us, we could still be thankful because the God of the universe chose to love us, even when there's nothing lovable about us. I think that this should also drive us to our knees in prayer because nothing that we do can convince someone or make someone become a Christian either for ourselves or for someone else. That's a work that only God can do in our hearts, right? We see that God reached down when Jonah was good, as good as dead. We see in Ephesians, we were dead in our trespasses. Unless God does the work of saving, unless God changes the heart, none of us are going to be able to experience salvation. So we should pray for other people. If you have unbelievers in your life that you're burdened for, if there are people maybe even yourself, ask God to change your heart because he is the only one who can do this work, right? Jonah didn't see a need to confess sin. Jonah was not seeing his need for God until he was at his lowest point. God had to send him to the depth of the sea and get him into a fish's stomach 
for Jonah to see his need for God. That is absolutely crazy, guys. Pray that God would help you to see your need for him. Pray that God would help others to see their need for him because only God is going to be able to do that work in someone's life. Okay, so Jonah finally starts crying out to the Lord. Well, what does he pray? What is the content of his prayer? When we pray to the Lord, when we encourage others to pray to the Lord, when we've been in sin and we need to confess, or maybe you've never confessed your sin, what do we pray? Let's look at the content of his prayer. Jonah 2, verse 2 says, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. Right? The first verse, that functions as a summary of what the entire psalm is going to be, right? Up until that point, we know that he hadn't prayed. It says that once he was in the bell, belly of the whale, that's when he started to pray. So this is a summary. And what does he do? He acknowledges God's sovereignty, God's authority, right? He says, uh, let's look at the verses, um, verse three, right? He says, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea. And then later he says, your waves and your billows passed over me. I am driven away from your sight. So is Jonah blaming God here, right? Because we, we see that the, the sailors, they were the people who hurled Jonah over. But he's saying God cast him into the sea. Or he's saying, I'm driven away from your presence. But didn't we see that Jonah was running away from God? So is he blaming God? I don't think he's blaming God. But I think what he's doing here is acknowledging God's sovereignty. Right, God will use circumstances in your life. If you're running from him, if you're living in sin, but you're one of God's children, or if God has predestined you to be one of his own, he will bring you to your point of realizing your need for him so that you'll call out to him. And with Jonah, it took taking him to that low point to see, I need God. And I think Jonah is acknowledging that and saying, hey, you drove me from your presence. You drove me to the depths of the sea, because that's what it took for Jonah to call out to the Lord. Jonah also acknowledges the severity of his situation and his need for God to help him, right? If you look at verse 3, verses 5 through 7, Jonah is getting to the point where he finally sees, I need God, right? He, he gives this Im imagery where the seaweed is wrapping around his head and the bars of the earth are closing around him. He's like, I feel like I'm getting imprisoned into my death, right? When he says into the belly of Sheol, that's a way of saying, I am in the heart of the grave. Like I'm, right, if you hear someone say, oh, he's six feet under the earth, that's uh, a way of saying like an idiom, a euphemism for someone has been buried and they're dead. And that was their way of saying, belly of Sheol, I'm in the pit of Sheol, I'm headed for death, I'm in the grave. And so that Jonah's like, I was dead. This is where I was at and I needed God. Jonah had blatantly disobeyed, but God in his kindness caused the storm and everything afterwards to happen to help Jonah see his need for God to bring him to repentance. So put this down for number point number two. Humbly confess your sin in desperate need for God. Humbly confess your sin in desperate need for God. We can learn a lot from what Jonah did and did not say in his prayer. Right? In his moment of desperate need, he does turn to God. We do see that. Right? He finally turns back to God, and that is good. Right? In your need, guys, whether you feel like you have a sin struggle and you just cannot overcome it, or maybe you feel like this world is going crazy or like my life is falling apart and I don't know what to do, I need God. Right? Turn to God. That is the right place to turn. Turning to entertainment to distract your mind, turning to friends, turning to reading books. I don't know. You can turn to so many different things in this world, but that's not going to give you the deliverance that you need. You need to turn to God. So what, Jonah is good in doing that. But one thing that isn't clear right off the bat, he never says, I've sinned against you. And this was honestly very frustrating for me, like puzzling as I was studying it. Did Jonah repent? Did he not? lots of guys smarter than me have written articles. Some people say Jonah didn't become a Christian or didn't become a follower of God here. Some people say he did. Some people say this wasn't genuine. Some do. And I do think it was genuine, but I was puzzled because he never says, this is the sin that I did. I turn from it. But we'll see that in his actions and even in his words, right? 
And this is where we're going to get into worldly sorrow and God, godly sorrow. So write down this cross-reference. Guys, this is going to be super helpful for throughout your whole life, I pray. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says this, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. I'm going to read that again. For godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas godly whereas worldly grief produces death, right? So it'd be very easy to look at Jonah's circumstances and say, oh, you really just don't want to be in a cramped stomach of a fish with stomach acids, and so you just want to get out of there. So that's why you're calling out to God. You just hate your circumstances, right? It would be very easy to say that's all Jonah wanted, which would be worldly sorrow because like, oh, I'm really sad that I disobeyed God because now I'm stuck in this fish. God, will you please get me out? I'm sorry. And then once he gets out, he just keeps running. Like that would be worldly sorrow. Like the, cal- like the Idaho driver, if he's driving reckless and he gets stuck, he's like, I'm really sorry. Will you please help me get out? And you help him get out and he keeps doing the same thing. That's not true sorrow, right? Because it doesn't lead to rep- repentance and salvation without regret. But what we do see is he turned away from his sin and he turned to God in obedience, right? He says, God, I call out to you, deliver me. And we even see that he vows to make sacrifices and keep those vows like the sailors did on the ship, right? We talked about that last night. The sailors, when they got off the ship, they gave thanksgiving to God. They sacrificed to God and they vowed to continue doing that because they trusted in Yahweh. And so Jonah makes a very similar statement here. And then we'll see later in Jonah that he ends up, the Lord comes to him again, says, go to Nineveh, call out against their sin. And this time he goes. And so we see that change. He put off disobedience and he put on obedience. But why do I emphasize all this? And why do I highlight what is there and what isn't there? Well, guys, I think it's very important that we confess our sins to God. When you pray, if you realize your desperate need, when you see that things are falling apart and you're stuck in sin, and, or even maybe you're not stuck, but you've, just, you've sinned against God, Confess that to the Lord, guys. Say, Lord, I have sinned against you in this way. Be specific, right? Oh, I'm sorry. I, like, Lord, I struggled with anger. Like, no, say like, Lord, I sinned against you by getting angry at my sibling in this way and saying words that were unloving. Because when we're specific, when we call our sin what it is, it helps us to understand why it's a big deal. We help to see it biblically. We see how it goes against God's holy nature. So, Be specific when you confess your sin and say, Lord, I'm sorry, because we need to see our sin for what it is. Growing up, guys, I was such an arrogant, self-righteous little kid. I did not think I had sin in my life. I could look at everyone else and be like, oh, they're sinful in this way, this way, this way, this way, this way. But if someone said, oh, well, Johnny, how do you struggle with sin? I'd be like, I don't know. Like, I don't think I'd be like, I don't have sin in my life because I knew that would be the wrong Bible answer. But I don't think I would have said like, oh, I'm really struggling with these things. If anything, it would be some Jesus-y answer where it's like, oh, I probably could read my Bible more. I could probably pray more. But I did not see the own sin in my life. And guys, pray that the Lord would show you your sin and then confess it. Because I would hate to see any of you guys get to the point where your life is you're as good as dead because you're stuck in your sin and you never turn to God for help. Right, we looked at 1 John 1, 9 a few weeks ago. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Part of me wonders if Jonah had called out to God while he was on the boat and if he had repented and confessed there, I think the Lord would have stopped the storm there. Maybe he would have, and then Jonah wouldn't have had to go through sinking to the depths of the sea, getting swallowed by the fish, all these things, right? And Kill sin while it's early. One of my pastors when I was growing up always used this analogy. Sin always starts out just as a small weed or maybe a small lizard, whatever analogy helps you think better. But if you don't kill sin when it's small, it will grow and grow and grow until it's a massive tree or it's a dragon. It's a lot easier to kill a lizard than it is to kill a dragon. It's a lot easier to pull out a weed with your hand than it is to chop down a tree uproot the whole root system, all of that stuff, right? Guys, deal with your sin while it's small. Don't, don't be stubborn. 
don't turn a blind eye to your sin and continue in it thinking that you can somehow get away with it. You won't. People try every single day to get away with their sin and it doesn't work. And if you're God's own, he is going to humble you. He's going to break you. So go in humility to the Lord. We look at John 14, 6, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, right? You're not going to find a way to deal with your sin. You're not going to find peace outside of going to Christ and confessing your sins. Proverbs 28, 13, whoever conceals his transgression will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy, right? So don't have worldly sorrow. Don't be sad that you got caught. Don't be sad that there are consequences. Don't be sad about your sin for a day or two, and then once the effects have worn off, just go right back into it. Guys, it is a vicious cycle. Instead, turn to God and say, God, I'm sorry, I've sinned against you. Please help me to change. And then seek, try to replace those sinful actions with obedience through the power of the Spirit. If you want a couple of examples, this could be something helpful to study in your own time. Write down these two references, Matthew 27, 3 through 10, okay? Matthew 27, 3 through 10, and then John 21, 15 through 19. John 21, 15 through 19. And what are these two passages? Well, what we look at, it's Judas and Peter, and it's their responses. They both denied Christ, right? Judas denied Christ and betrayed him to the Pharisees, and then Peter three times denied Christ. But what we see in these two passages is then they are both sorrowful. They are both sad about it, but you see two very different responses. What does Judas do? He goes and he kills himself. That is not godly repentance. That is worldly sorrow. But then you see Peter who confesses and he's restored to Jesus. He says, Lord, I love you. Like I love you. And Jesus like, follow me, right? And so those two passages, I think, would be a helpful thing to study. Like, what is worldly repentance, worldly sorrow versus godly sorrow? So for us, how do we apply this? It's what we've been saying. See your sin for what it is. Admit that you need God and then go to him. Confess, ask him to forgive you and ask him to help you change. But then it doesn't just stop there because, right, we talk about change. And that gets into this third point. Right, One of the easiest ways to tell if you have worldly sorrow or godly sorrow is to see how you choose to live once your circumstances improve. Right, In that passage in Corinthians, it says, godly sorrow leads to repentance and salvation without regret. Right, And so when your circumstances, let's say, okay, Idaho driver, his circumstances change, he's back on the road, he's good, his circumstances are better. Does he go right back to his old ways of sin or has he changed? Right, And for us, maybe you've sinned, you've confessed it, now your circumstances are better, what changes? Do you go right back to your sin or do you seek to follow Christ in obedience? And that's what we have for point number three, repent and follow God as your Lord and Savior. Repent and follow God as your Lord and Savior, right? In Jonah 2 verses 8 and 9, he says, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. So Jonah has cried out to God, and this is where we see the repentance take place. And it's such a beautiful thing. He says, Lord, I cried out to you. People who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope. But I will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. He is vowing to serve the Lord with thanksgiving and we see him carry that out with the obedience, right? We see God saved Jonah so that he could preach to the Ninevites. So hopefully uh, God saved him so that he would see his sin and turn back to God, right? God brought this, this fish into Jonah's life for that to happen. And so God has saved you so that you can love him, so that you can love others. He doesn't redeem you just so you can keep on living for yourself. No, we, he redeems you so that you can love him and love others, so that you can enjoy life the way that he created it to be. We talked about this a lot last Sunday, right? If you say that you are in the light but hate your brother, you're not truly in the light, right? It doesn't make sense. God saves you so that you can love. God didn't save Jonah so that he could 
get out of the fish and then keep running or go back to Israel and just keep living his life. No, he saved Jonah so that he could go to Nineveh and fulfill the calling that God had for him. So when God saves us, he doesn't save us so that we can keep on sinning. Guys, sin is corrupted. It is awful. It ruins lives and ends people's lives in destruction. It hurts yourself. It hurts others. It's sinning against God. Sin is just awful, awful, awful. God does not want you. He doesn't save you so that you can keep doing that. There's a better way, right? AJ is really sweet. She just bought me this new grinder. So I have this hand grinder and I would sit there and grind my coffee and grind my coffee. And it takes like five minutes. And she says, I look like I'm from the early 1500s grinding flour. It's great. And so she got me this new grinder where I just hit a button and just it's done in like 15 seconds. Super nice. She didn't buy that new grinder so that then I could sit. If I just sat there and kept doing this, like, thanks for the gift, babe. And I just keep doing this. It's like, no, she didn't buy me that grinder so I could keep doing this. She bought me the new grinder to use the new grinder and enjoy that, right? God doesn't save you so that you can keep going on in your sin and just living and enjoying that. No, your sin is awful. And he's saying, no, there's a better way. I've saved you so that you can love me and love others, that you can experience joy even in the hardest things so that you can experience patience when all the rest of the world would get angry, so that you can experience peace when the rest of the world would be anxious, right? God saves you for those things. And he saved Jonah from death so that he could go preach the good news of repentance to the Ninevites. You can look at examples of this, uh, looking at the life of the apostle Paul. He was a murderer. God saved him. He put off his self-righteousness. He put off murder and he became a missionary and preaching the gospel and an apostle of the Lord. You look at, I mean, all of the testimonies that we hear at church, just look at anyone whose life has changed because of God. Look at how they were living their life before God and look at how they're living their life after coming to Christ. And look at your own life, okay? Maybe you're seeing your life and you're saying, I don't see a change. I've just always done the same thing. I keep going in this vicious cycle. There is no change. Be honest with yourself. Maybe you haven't come to know Christ yet, but that's okay. Christ has allowed you to continue living so that you can come to him now, that you can repent now. So make today the day where you confess your sins and you look to God for help and seek to live a life that is pleasing to him, following him. So with that, we're going to pray and go to small groups. Lord, we thank you that you save us when we don't deserve saving, when we were running from you, when we were disobedient, when we hated you, that's when you reached down to save us. And we thank you, Lord, for that. I pray for anyone here today who has not experienced that salvation, Lord, I pray that you would help them to see their desperate need for you, help them to see their sin for what it is. And I pray that you would bring them to the point of repentance that leads to salvation in life without regret. Lord, I pray that you bless these small group times now. In Jesus' name, amen.